All right. So we're going to dive into built by many, built by many. Here's the reality. We are, you are sitting right now in a local church, and uh, wherever you're at, you may be at different places of your involvement with this local church, okay? You might be here for the first time, and we're so glad that you're here. You might have lost count of how many times you've sat in your specific seat that you're really fond of, in your specific location, that if anybody's in, it really throws off your day and you can't really recover, right? And, uh, and you're like, this is my spot, and I know where I sit. I know what service I go to. Um, and, and, and you're used to this, wherever you're at, can I just tell you and remind you that what's taking place at Artisan Church is not because of the effort of a few, it's because of the sacrifice of many. And that is what moves it forward, is people saying, Man, I want to play my part. I want to discover how I fit into this whole thing that we call church. And I'm just going to be honest, up front, we've been saying this for years now, we are not a slip in the back and just check your box of church attendance type of a church. Uh, there's seasons where maybe we just man, we just barely got here and we're not wanting to talk and we're not wanting to socialize and, and we're just saying, man, I just got to slip in and I barely made it. And we're so grateful that you're here. But the reality is, is that Jesus loves you way too much for you to stay in that place. He's got more for you, he's got more for Artisan Church, and he's got more for all of us working together what he's called us to. We're not that just check the box, church attendance type church. Why? Because you matter way too much. You are far too valuable to the kingdom of God to be sitting on the sidelines, peering in, and watching what God is doing from the outside. I really believe it. God is calling you to be involved in his church. Jesus calls it his very his bride. I actually believe this, that you can't really claim to love Jesus and then with the same breath say that you hate his bride, right? It's really hard to love Jesus and hate his church. He calls you to involvement in community. It's not an option. As you begin to approach the New Testament passages, you see over and over again a calling to be involved in church. And I hope you've realized something, and, I, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of weeks as we talked about secularism, as we talked about the lies of the enemy, the devil's schemes, what he's trying to do, right? We talked about how our enemy is never people, it's the lie that they're believing, right? So if somebody's coming at you and attacking you, man, what, what's the narrative right now that the devil's got a hold of them on? And so as Christians, we don't hate people, we don't come at people, we go, man, what's the narrative that's bringing death? Those are his schemes, they are lies, but I hope you've realized that those lies have taken hold in such a way that there's been a shift in Western society. It's gone from a place that will praise you for church involvement to now it will shame you for it. And, and it's interesting. This is a shift that's happened like within my lifetime, right? I remember being in high school and like I had no issue telling people to come to church. Like I thought my, I was spending my Wednesday nights at youth group was the best place I could ever be. And I had about as much tact as I would just go up to people like, you're stupid. You're, you have a boring life. Come to church. Like it's more fun than what you're doing. I'm like, what are you doing? Wasting away your Wednesday night. You're, you idiot. Come over here. Like get into church. Like that was as much tact as I had. Cause I'm like, don't be dumb. Get in church. Like let's do this. There was no, never for a second was I thinking, man, I, I wonder what kind of heat I'm going to get. Because I go to church. I, I, I wonder what kind of shade and cyberbullying I'm going to get if I tell people that I go to church. And yet our high schoolers today are living with the tension of they will not be celebrated because they're involved in church. They will not be celebrated because they serve Jesus. There will actually come against them just a, an avalanche of attack, an avalanche of aggression for many young Christians today. And even as... We've grown older, right? Even now I'm realizing, wow, this has shifted substantially. And now if you go way back, right, in Western history, I just recently listened to a podcast on Jamestown because that's where I'm at in my life, okay? History podcasts, that's where I'm at. And so I'm listening to the history podcast on Jamestown. And it's one of the very first settlements that actually essentially survived. And Jamestown... They, uh, would, they actually instituted the death penalty for skipping church. So, so we've gone from the death penalty from skipping church to where we are today. 
and no, I'm not saying I want to reinstitute the death penalty for skipping church. Like, you're good. Like, it's all okay. But the reality is it was like so not optional to the point of like, man, what's wrong with you if you don't want to be in church to how could you ever go to church? Are you a bigot? Are you a hater? Oh, that's gross. How could you ever go there? How could you ever want to be a part of that? That's the shift that has happened. And we can be angry about it. We can be frustrated about it. Or we can realize that it requires uh, maybe an understanding on our part to understand the world we're called to reach and to navigate it. There is a cost to this. There is a cost to say, I want to be a part of of builders. There's a cost to say built by many. I'm a part of it. I'm a part of that church. I'm a part of that community of faith. I'm sacrificing for it. I I believe in it and I love Jesus. There is a cost. But there was something at our builders dinner. We had an evening and 120 leaders within our church signed up to be there to hear in detail the vision and mission of where we're going at Artisan Church. And we spent a whole night together talking about it and builders and what it means. And there was a phrase that I wrote down during my short talk, and I can't shake it. And I just felt so like I needed to share it with our whole church, that builders is not what we do, it's who we are. Like, this is something you get to be. I am a builder of the church. I am a builder of the gospel message of Jesus. I am a builder of this community of faith. This is who I am, and it affects every area of my life. And this week, we're going to break down essentially the first of what I would call like three pillars of what it means to be a builder. So I started to ask myself this question even after the builder's dinner, like, that's great. We're inviting people to be a builder, But what does that look like? What are the necessary components to say, I am a builder? And and I really believe this, that what we're going to talk about this week is the first priority if you want to be a builder. Because this week we are going to break down formation. We're going to break down discipleship. What does it look like to really truly have a personal walk with Jesus? And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, kind of gives us a picture of what we're talking about from a broad sense, and then we're going to be able to break it down. Let's go there right now. It says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So if you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you said yes, you don't just get to be saved because now you are a citizen of hev- heaven and you are a member of his household. You now are called to be a part of the local church. Built, this household is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. We talked a little bit about Jesus as the cornerstone when we talked about our feet shod with the gospel of peace, that we're standing on the cornerstone of Jesus. And then it gets really good. It says, in him, the whole building, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You read that again. And in him, you too, you, in the seat, right there, you, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We see this over and over and over again in the New Testament where it says that there is a receiving and indwelling of the Holy Spirit that takes place when we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, that you are filled with the Spirit, and then there is, or you're, there's an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and then there's continual opportunity to be filled with the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit wants to move in power in his people, that we are now the temple of the living God. But I love this phrase that you are being built. I want you to catch this. There's going to be a theme in all of the scriptures that we read. There is a progressive work that the Apostle Paul continually writes about. You are being built. This was not a final at salvation, it was done, the work is over, you can now chill. Because I really believe this, I don't think we should try to build his church 
without first building your life in him. For a lot of people who go, okay, I got saved, so now I got to dive headlong into service. I got to start doing everything I can to serve. I got to do everything I can to serve. How much can I serve? But there's this story in scripture that paints a really helpful picture. It's the story of two women, Mary and Martha. And Jesus is at a house, and Martha takes on the hostess, and she starts making all the food, and she's preparing everything. She's doing all the work, and Mary's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, just listening. And Martha's over there getting bitter in the kitchen. I can't believe she's not helping. I can't believe no one's doing this. If it weren't for me, no one's eating. I hope they appreciate me. Do they see me? Do they know me? Do they realize that I'm here? Hello, I'm doing this. I just can hear it now. She's like clanging the dishes. Like she's banging them together, like hoping somebody catches it. And they're all there just in awe of Jesus. But Jesus actually has a moment where he corrects corrects Martha in this. And I think it's interesting because he says, no, 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 Mary's got this part right. I'm with her right now. She's in my presence. She's spending time in my presence. She's making sure. She's sitting at my feet. She's spending time with me before she's going out and into the world, before she's going out and doing other things, before she's going out and serving. She's getting filled. See, a lot of people get saved and then we go to work. We start ending up with that Martha attitude. Nobody sees me. Nobody appreciates me. I don't even think it's worth it. All they want is something from me. They don't even want something for me. And the church just wants my effort. The church just wants my work. The church just wants my money. The church just wants fill in the blank. Because at the end of the day, we start serving in our mind the church and stop serving Jesus. So if we want to talk about building the kingdom of God, if we want to talk about building a church, it has to start from the foundation of Jesus Christ. It has to start with an intimacy with our Savior, a relationship with him, and a formation process with Jesus. And then uh, there's a beautiful text out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 through 18 that's really going to help us understand the point I'm attempting to make today. It says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Anybody heard that verse before? Come on, somebody. Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But then it continues. And we all, who with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory. Now, honestly, I really believe this, that the second part of this text isn't quoted because people are like, I don't know what an unveiled face means. Let me help us for just a moment. This is actually a beautiful parallel because if you read all of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you actually begin to see Paul's emphasis and focus within this chapter. He's actually taking time to articulate to his hearers that the spirit of the living God that is now in them, that they are now a temple of, is even a greater expression and a greater experience than what Moses had on Mount Sinai, that Moses had when he would go into the tabernacle. He's actually creating a parallel. Because if you don't know, as people studied the Old Testament law, there was this idolization of Moses almost to the point of making him a deity. Like he was almost right up there with God. He was considered so incredible. Why? Because when Moses got around God, his face would literally glow. And so there was this idolization that Moses could be in the presence of God. So much so, the manifest presence was making him glow. He was shining. He was gleaming in such a way that it actually scared people. And they had to put on a, he had to put on a veil to cover his face. That he actually had to cover his face when he would talk to the Israelites because he was glowing. And so, but realize, what did God say? Moses, you're only going to get a part of my presence because my full presence would kill you. Why is that? Full presence of God and all its glory would kill him? Well, the Old Testament law said that sin, the penalty for sin, was death. It's about as extreme as if you miss church, it's a death penalty. That's what Old Testament law reads as. And so when they assembled the tabernacle, there was another veil. There was a curtain that actually separated the holy of holies from the rest of the people. And what it gave them the opportunity to do was to bring sacrifices to atone for their sin because otherwise the penalty was death if it wasn't atoned. 
And now all of a sudden, Paul starts to write to the church in Ephesus, or sorry, in, in Corinth. In Corinth, he starts to write, and he's telling them, hey, the presence of God that you get to experience, the fullness of it, it doesn't bring death. It brings life because you can actually encounter this fullness. Why? Because your sin is now covered. It's atoned for by the sacrifice of Jesus. So you get to have an unveiled face. You get to encounter all of it. You get to experience the fullness of the presence of man. You guys are quiet. This is good news. Do you know this? Like, this is really good news, and you're really intense. First service was like, woo! Let's go. You guys are like, oh my God, what does this mean? It's not bad. It's good. You don't have the veil, because what happened when Jesus died? What happened to the curtain? It ripped. It tore in two, and the presence of God came to us so that he might dwell in us so that we get to be the temple of that spirit. And so Paul is paralleling to the church in Corinth, New Testament believers, that now they get to experience more of the presence of God than even Moses did. And you don't need to wear a veil. You don't need to cover it. You can experience the fullness of it. So he says, with unveiled faces, we contemplate the Lord's glory, and we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, as we look at this text, there's two key parts. The number one is contemplating the Lord's glory. We're going to talk about that in regards to our personal formation with Jesus. Second piece is, and with ever increasing glory. So first thing, contemplate the Lord's glory. This word contemplate is vital. Have you ever had a moment where you tell people like, hey, can you just give me a second? I need to think. Can you just give me a second? I need to work this out. Can you give me a second? Come on, all the moms and dads with little kids, you're like, I know what this is like. I don't get to contemplate anything. I just have rah, 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 right, screaming. You're like, just give me a second so I can think, and I'll give you an answer. We want to contemplate things. Sometimes we need space. We need time to sort of take things in, right? This fall, my wife and I, we are obsessed with fall and the changing of the trees and all the different things. And there's this one specific maple tree on our, we have a prayer trail that we've made, and there's this one specific maple tree. And it becomes this like insanely bright color yellow. It's like, it's just vibrant. It's incredible. And last year, we missed it. You get like a day, maybe two of like this perfect color. And so this year, we had like all this fear of like, are we going to miss it? Don't miss the tree. And so we're going on the trail like almost every day. Like, is it ready? Has it turned? Don't miss it. And the one day where it's like the bright yellow, Renee's like, I almost do it. Do I just like camp underneath it tonight and just like sit here and try to like take this tree in before the leaves fall because it's fleeting? I want to sit and contemplate the beauty of this tree. I want to sort of take it in, right? And sometimes as we get older, it becomes a little bit easier to sit and to contemplate things. I, I remember a dream trip to New York City for me when I was a young adult was literally making a decision at one in the morning with two of my friends going, should we just drive to New York City? Should we just like go there? And we had literally about 52 hours before we had to be at work again. And we're like, we could do this. It's 21 hours there. 21 hours back, that's 42 hours in the car, but 10 hours in New York City. That math works. Let's go. And so we jump in my little Nissan 200SX. I don't know how it made it. It was a terrible 1992 car. And we're driving, three of us, and we had no time to waste. So, of course, we would do a, a, a live rotation. The person in the back seat gets to sleep. Person in shotguns keeping the driver awake. And then when the driver needs to sleep, Puts it in cruise control. The passenger steers. He flips the seat back, rolls into the back seat, and you just rotate while you go. Come on, somebody. We don't even need to stop. And if you're wondering how we handled other things, you can figure that out on your own. <laughs> but we made it. And we get to New York City, and you have 10 hours in New York City. What do you want to see? Everything. We got to see all the things. And so we're powering out all the stops. And I remember talking to somebody after we got back, and they were like, yeah, but did you see the Empire State Building? I'm like, of course I saw the Empire State Building. They were like, yeah, but isn't it amazing, the view from the top? I was like, oh, we didn't, we didn't go up it. And they're like, what do you mean? You said you saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went to the base of it, looked up, and then went to the next thing. We didn't have time. And they're like, you know, you didn't experience the Empire State Building. You'd only stood at the base of it. You're supposed to go up to the observation deck. You're supposed to see the sights and see the city from up there. And I'm like, oh, it, who cares? We saw it. What's funny is now, 
this version of me, <laughs> a little bit older. First of all, I'm flying, right? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Second of all, if I'm going to New York City and I'm trying to take in the Empire State Building, I'm probably listening to like three podcasts. I want to know the story of the architect. I want to know how much it costs. Like where did they quarry the stone from? You know what I mean? And how did they get it in the city? And how deep did they dig the foundation? I'm going to sit. I'm going to take it all in. I'm going to start texting everyone I know in the city and be like, who's got the plug to get me up to the even higher tower? Because I know there's the one the public goes to, but I want to get the most out of my experience. So I'm trying to get up to the the secret tower. I'm trying to get high up there because I want to contemplate this building. I want to take it in. And the reality is for many, we accept Jesus. Hey, that's a good message. I'm all in. I'll do it. But we barely made it there. We're tired. We're worn out. We're kind of a hot mess. And so we sort of camp out at salvation. But it's like being at the base of the Empire State Building. Jesus is like, I have so much more for you to see and experience and do, and you're just, you're calling it quits there? No, 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 come on, be formed. Contemplate who I am. Contemplate my ways. Contemplate my glory. You see, when we stop at salvation, we can fall into the trap of, what have you done for me lately, God? This phrase, what have you done for me lately? Let's put it up on the screen, just so it's up there. What have you done for me lately? It's not just a scary sentence when it comes to your faith. This is one in life, right? Have you ever fallen into this trap where somebody's like, man, what have you done for me lately? You haven't even done anything special for me. Come on, singles in the room, you got to be careful the standard you set on like the first date, right? Because if you set the bar too high, then the expectation is like, when are you doing it again? You know, what you used to do, you used to buy me, you used to go, you used to, what have you done for me lately? Sometimes we fall prey to this with God because we know that salvation is what? It's a free gift. So we accept this incredible free gift and what gift could possibly be better than you died for me to set me free? It's this amazing gift. And then we go, okay, What's next, Jesus? What's the next thing you've got for me? What's the next free gift? And he's like, oh, actually, so I, I, I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. I'm going to give you purpose like you never thought. I, I've got a calling for you. I've got adventures for you. This is going to be the most exciting thing ever. But now I need some things from you on the way. Uh, it's actually, I've set it up where it's obedience that leads to blessing post-salvation. It, it's not at, wait for your blessing and then be obedient. It's actually be obedient and then I'll bless you. Watch what I'll do. It's actually reaping and sowing. Let me teach you about reaping and sowing. So we get that free gift. We stand at the base of the tower and we go, cool. Jesus, do the rest of it for me. And he's like, no, no, no. You got to start climbing some floors. Got some steps to get in. Got some work to do. Contemplate. Spend time with me. This is going to be a progressive work. We can't stop at the free gift of salvation because then we never engage in the truth that it's better to give than to receive. God, I'm supposed to give things away. I want to, I want to serve. I want to love. I want to give. Paul says contemplate. This is a time thing. This is an effort thing. I need to sit here. I need to take it in. I need to research. I need to understand. I need to think. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19 tells us this. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, come on, you know this part, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This text right here gives us a picture of why contemplation is necessary, doesn't it? How wide, how deep. Come on, these pictures of how long is the love of Christ. Have you sat in that? Have you sat there and gone, man, God, I want to understand the depth of your love. I want to get to the point that I understand this love that surpasses knowledge a little bit more, that I might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And the reality is we want this to be one moment, but it isn't written that way. This, to understand this kind of love takes time, takes contemplation, takes effort. Let me summarize this first point, that contemplation is essential to your formation. You got to sit. You got to work this thing out. 
Let me ask you some questions. Do you contemplate the hard questions or do you avoid them? The hard questions of faith, the challenging sticking points, or do we avoid them? Do you contemplate the meaning of Scripture or do you just read it? Ah, checkbox. Do you contemplate the reasons why you keep going back to that sin or do you just kind of hope it stops and you outgrow it? Do you contemplate the ways that God is for you? Do you contemplate the ways that God loves you? Do you wait, contemplate the ways that God sees you? Do you contemplate the way God, God wants to use you? Are we spending time sitting in his presence and shifting our perspective through contemplation? And as the keys come on up, let's talk about the second one. Being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So first, the call is we need to sit and contemplate the glory of God. We need to sit on that. We need to spend some time. We need to create some space. We need to make some effort. But then, as we do, what's the promise? We get transformed more into his image with ever-increasing glory. We are a church that talks about the image of God often, the Imago Dei. But what was the thing that made us made in God's image more? Was it that he shaped our body a specific way? Or was it that he breathed something intentional into us in Genesis? See, he actually breathed something into you. He breathed himself into you in such a way that is different than all of creation. Something unique, something special. You were made in his image because he put his breath in you. We are transformed by the inside out, not the outside in. Our formation starts on the inside and works its way out. Why? Because his image is on the inside of you. And if it's ever increasing in its glory, if the love surpasses knowledge, if we are being built together, if it's all of these progressive works, then that means, church, that you have not arrived. Like when it comes to your personal walk, before figuring out how you fit into the mosaic of the local church, your personal walk, you have not arrived. Maybe right now where you sit, you feel really good about your walk with Jesus. Praise God for that. You've not arrived. Maybe where you sit right now, you feel terrible about your walk with Jesus. You're like, no, Pastor Sam, I am so stuck in sin. Trust me, you've not arrived. You're not going to stay there. There is ever increasing glory that's being offered to you. There is a sanctification process that is progressive in its nature that Jesus wants you to engage with. You need to be transformed more. Your family needs you to be formed more. Your church needs you to be discipled, needs you to move forward in this. One of the biggest challenges about pastoring is I can't make people choose discipleship. It's, it's like parenting, right? How many of you know you can only encourage good character? They have to choose to build their character. They have to make decisions. Every single one of us has to make decisions to say, you know what? I've not arrived. I want to see that ever-increasing glory in my life. You know, as we've studied secularism, especially last week, kept thinking about it. But one of the worst parts about the lie of secularism of the world, of just doing whatever feels good, whatever you want, you don't need it to be connected to some higher purpose, higher power. We talked about the imminent frame, what that does for us rather than the transcendent frame. It's, it's believing that we only have what's here. We talked about this last week. One of the saddest things about the imminent frame is it's an, op it's an offer to settle. Just, you're fine. You're okay. Just stay where you're at. You're, anyways, you're a byproduct of everything that's happened to you. There's nothing you could do about it. You're a victim. You can't rise above it. Just do what feels good. Rise up. Take your day. Whatever you need, that's what you need. You don't need to challenge yourself. You don't just settle. And all of a sudden, what are the greatest virtues of the world right now? Affirmation and tolerance. As long as you are affirming and tolerant, then all of a sudden you can just kind of do whatever you want, whatever feels good. But don't challenge people. Don't suggest growth. Don't suggest health. People are just doing what they can do just to get by. Come on, it's 2024. The world's crazy. So we just got to do what we need to do. That's not the offer of Scripture. It's not the offer of the gospel. And honestly... It's terrible. That's terrible news. 
thank God that we are offered what we call good news. The gospel. And this is why our church has stated the value of improvement. We don't see settling as an option. The offer is increasing, ever increasing glory that we get to experience. Essentially, man, the little bit that I've tasted, it's not enough. I want more. God, I want all of you. I want everything you've offering me. I want more. Come on, I want more gifts of the Spirit, and I want to produce more fruit of the Spirit. Because my family's hungry, I'm going to feed them fruit of the Spirit first. God, I need more of your presence to fill me every single day. I'm not going to ride out yesterday's move of God. I want a fresh move of God. I'm not going to live off yesterday's revival. I want a fresh revival because I want to see ever increasing glory in my life, which means that no matter what happens to my physical body as it decays, as I age, come on somebody, Sunday, flag football reminded me, I'm getting older. I can't do what I used to do, okay? I'm not as fast as I used to be. Still won the championship though. Uh Uh-oh. But I see the limitations, right? But guess what? God works from the inside out, not the outside in. Why? Because he breathed his very life into you. He put it on the inside of you. And he's saying, watch what I do when I get a hold of it. What does that mean? It means no matter your age or stage in the room, if your best is behind you, then discipleship is beyond you. If you have said, my best days in the spirit, my best days in my faith, my best days, my best encounters, my best experiences, my my, my best usage from God is behind me, then what are you discipling under? I actually had this as I was prepping. I'm not kidding. I started to picture. I'm like, God, I actually want this. I've never said this phrase out loud. I was like, God, I, I, want, I want to be so connected to you by the time I die on my deathbed. I want it to be so real and transparent that nobody can even walk into the room without encountering your presence. I want to be so close. I want that veil between us to be so torn that the very presence of manifest presence of God is on me at all times. That as I I step into eternity, my best moments are at the very end. I never want to think like I could ever arrive or get to the point where there's no more discipleship, no more formation, no more intimacy with Jesus that is needed. If your best is behind you, then discipleship is beyond you. Paul made it so clear in every letter that living to the letter of the law, the Old Testament law, would not form you properly. He continually brought it back to intimacy with Jesus. So I wonder, what if we tracked formation by intimacy with Jesus, not distance from sin? See, for a lot of us, we walk into church with a lot of shame because we remember the last moment we sinned. In fact, some of you almost have a running time clock. It's almost like you have your, 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 your iPhone out and you're setting a timer. Every time you sin, you go, how long can I go between sins? And the longer I go between sins speaks to the level of formation I've encountered. Rather than my formation is determined by my personal intimacy with Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you something. For me, every time I get closer to my Savior, my desires for sin dissipate. And the motivation is proximity to him. I want to get so close to him, and I know that sin separates me from him. So when I sin, I don't start a time clock. I go, Jesus, cover it. Convict me. Let's move on. I'm going to get back to being with you. Let's keep being formed. It doesn't reset your formation. That's such a low view of the grace he gives us, isn't it? That every single sin would reset your personal formation. Now you're back to square one because you lost your temper. All that works for nothing. Got to start over. No, of course not. Proximity to Jesus is the measurement I want to have for my life. How close to Jesus am I? And how much of an impact is that having on my community and those around me and my family? Because every day I'm being formed by the, by the things that are closest to me. The closest people, closest content, closest thoughts. So how do we ensure that we are being formed consistently into the image of God with ever-increasing glory? Stay as close as we absolutely can. Stay as filled as we absolutely can to overflowing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 through 10, as we close, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. And once you've done that, amazing, receive Jesus. My new, the old is gone, the new has come. 
It's also being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Again, do you hear it? Progressive language. It is being renewed. It's being renewed. You have not arrived. We must keep being formed. So before we go to serve his church, we first have to be formed in his image. Do you hear me? Before we try and go make all, go change the world, we got to make sure at first I'm being formed in his image so I do it correctly. Because otherwise our formation might get out of alignment like Martha. And we get to this place where we're going, I'm, I'm out of alignment. Essentially sit in his presence before you serve his people. Read his word before declaring his truth. Pray in his name before you speak his name. Feed your soul before you try and feed others. Fix your eyes on him before you set your eyes to the future. Do you see it? Those are just a couple examples. I'm prioritizing that formation so everything else comes off of that. What are you ensuring if you do that? You're ensuring that you're building your life on the foundation of Jesus, that he is the chief cornerstone. He is the beginning and the end of your life. Amen? Amen. Let's take a moment. Let's pray and seal this word in our hearts. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everybody gathered in this room. Lord, I pray that as we just consider more of what it means to be formed into your image, this progressive work that your word is constantly reminding us of, Lord, I pray that it would not be shame that is felt in the room right now. God, but there would be some deep hope that where we are is not where we're going to stop. If we feel stuck, we can start moving because we want to measure our life of faith by intimacy with you, Jesus. We want to grow in our hunger for your presence, our desire to be with you. Jesus, would you just keep speaking to us, keep moving us forward, position us so that we can play a role in building your church, reaching your people, and spreading the gospel. But we want all of it to come from a place of experiencing the ever-increasing glory you offer, of contemplating your glory, contemplating your goodness, contemplating who you are. We love you, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Won't you stand to your feet?